So good morning, everyone. My name is Zachary Kelly, and I'm the Assistant Director of the Institute of Slavic, East European, and Eurasian Studies at UC Berkeley. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce Jose Vergara, who is an Assistant Professor of Russian Language and Russian Literature at Bryn Mawr College. Um, I would call this the last of my three Wisconsin series as a fellow Wisconsin alum, and um, Jose as well, coming from the grad program at Slavic at Wisconsin. Um, but today he'll be speaking to us on a topic that goes both Slavic and then goes beyond into our uh, Irish and British and English speaking world. So today, um, Jose Vergara, he is a scholar and teacher of Russian language and Russian literature in the long of the long 20th century at Bryn Mawr College, where he is also associated with the comparative literature program. His book, All Future Plunges to the Past, James Joyce in Russian Literature, which you can see here with a wonderful cover, um, which came out through Nor Northern Illinois University Press slash the Cornell University Press in 2021, explores how Russian writers from the mid 1920s to the present day have read and creatively responded to Joyce's fiction. It illuminates how they have used Joyce's ideas as a critical lens to shape, prod, and constantly redefine their own place in literary history. Jose's current research inspired by recent teaching experiences addresses the latest in Russian prison texts. It examines how the authors of these stories position themselves vis-a-vis -vis their predecessors and challenges and challenge the tradition's form. He is interested in both narratives written by artists who have been jailed, as well as those who became writers because they were imprisoned, and those that turned their gaze further back, such as fictional accounts of Soviet prison labor camps. He's also developing a project on Chernobyl's international resonance, co-editing a volume of essays on teaching Nabokov, forthcoming from Amherst College Press, and producing a bilingual digital annotated edition of Sasha Sokolov's dense novel Between Dog and Wolf. His teaching interests cover a wide variety of topics, Russian language, prison literature, Chernobyl, Russian novel of the classical and experimental varieties, and contemporary culture and society. He has previously taught courses in prisons, including nearby OCI Chester, and is a passionate advocate for the public and digital humanities. His writing and interviews have also appeared in the Los Angeles Review of Books, Asymptote, mis Music and Literature, Words Without Borders, and World Literature Today. So Jose, thank you for joining us uh, virtually and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Zach. Um, and I'd like to uh, thank everyone for joining us this afternoon slash morning um, and thank ICES for having me and Zach for, for coordinating this and the whole series. It's been really great to follow along. Um, and today I'm, I'm really delighted uh, and honored to have this opportunity to share some of my research and to talk a little bit about my book with you all. Um, before that, though, I, I did want to just acknowledge the briefly the the moment we're in right now, what, what's taking place in Ukraine. Um, as as you mentioned, Zach, my book is called "All Future to the Past." Uh, excuse me, "All Future Plunges to the Past," and I think, like like many of you, like all of us, um, I've really just been watching in, in horror as our future seems to be doing just that: this return to what was before. Um, and I hope, desperately hope, that we can escape what uh, James Joyce's hero, Stephen Dedalus, called the, the nightmare of history, find a way out of all of this. Um, and I'd like to share my screen now. Hopefully you can see that. Um, as I said, for my talk today, I thought I'd, <laughs> thanks, Zach. Uh, I thought I'd share the, the main arguments of my book, along with some examples from a couple case studies and finally close with a few insights from the conclusion of the book for which I interviewed uh, uh, living writers about Joyce. So first, going back to the 20s and 30s, uh, when the playwright Sivlod Vishnevsky visited Joyce in Paris in 1936, uh, the two had much to discuss. The Irish writer mentioned that he'd heard that his books were banned in the Soviet Union. Yushnevsky was pleased to report that Ulysses had been translated earlier than in many other countries. Um, and Vishnevsky wasn't lying, but a champion of Joyce's art, he exaggerated. Uh, the 1925 translation of Ulysses, um, in fact, consisted only of fragments. And this was one of the first translations into any language of Ulysses. Furthermore, the head of the International Information Bureau of the Central Committee, Karl Radek, had infamously led an attack which began in the early 1930s and laid the groundwork for the next several decades of criticism. A pile of dung, 
teeming with worms, photographed with a cinema apparatus through a microscope. But are they proclaimed? That's Joyce. Still, some recognize Joyce's genius. Boris Poplavsky, the young emigre writer, delivered a lecture in 1930 in which he asserted his profound admiration. Everything taken together creates an absolutely stunning document, something so real, so alive, so diverse, and so truthful that it seems to us that if it were necessary to send to Mars or God knows where, a single sample of earthly life or facing the destruction of European civilization to preserve a single book for posterity, perhaps it would be best to leave Joyce's Ulysses. Statements such as those of Radek and Poplavsky stand at maximalist extremes, reflecting the wide range of emotions and strong opinions Joyce's text elicited and continue to elicit from readers of these different artistic and ideological camps. But before becoming anathema to the Soviet regime, Joyce was widely discussed, if not frequently read. His art then turned into a forbidden fruit to be enjoyed mostly in private until the publication of the Victor Hinkis, Sergei Haruji, Ulysses translation in the late 1980s. Nevertheless, Joyce became an attractive symbol for a branch of Western literature in Soviet and emigre communities. What they appreciated in his text varied, a radical approach to language, new devices, the ability to transform one's experience as a budding artist into a national epic, a dangerous or progressive influence. It was really all over. And amid these various points of emphasis, Russians crafted a personal version of Joyce, a kind of my Joyce, uh, my Pushkin, my Pushkin, while responding to similar concerns, history and paternity foremost among them. Indeed, while Russian literature's conversation with Joyce touches on many subjects, Joyce's project to alter his past and his future through writing, as exemplified by his protagonist, Stephen Dedalus's aesthetic theories in Ulysses, serves as a major through line in this story. And the five writers I uh, focus on, Vladimir Nabokov, Andrei Bitov, Sasha Sakulov, and Mikhail Shishkin are fascinated by, even obsessed with, the question of literary heritage. The Russian historical experience irrevocably altered how artists might relate to their predecessors by cutting them out from the tradition, by limiting access to a lineage and a place in the development of world literature. Partly for this reason, Stephen's Shakespeare theory in, in Ulysses serves as a productive lens through which to examine these writers' relations to Joyce. Um, so in particular, in episode nine of Ulysses, the ninth chapter, Stephen suggests that uh, the artist, uh, the writer, can rewrite the past by creating lasting art and by selecting a literary forefather to supplant the biological uh, kind of creative rewriting of history. According to him, for instance, Shakespeare became a father to himself by writing Hamlet and there, uh, therefore engendering the world's, uh, the broader world's conception of the bard, the Shakespeare we know. All five of these Russian writers and others responded to this idea in Ulysses based on their circumstances. Joyce's creation served as one impetus for their experiments, among others, um, but the theory, the Shakespeare theory, also functions as a mirror by which their anxieties and goals can be observed. Simultaneously, the subject raises the issue of how throughout the 20th century, uh, cultural values changed in the Soviet Union, Russian immigra immigration, and the post-1991 Russian environment. What was possible? What was desirable? Where did Russian literature belong? Their responses to Joyce's texts, particularly Ulysses and Finnegan's Wake, uh, speak to how they tackled such immense questions relative to their own time and place. And to give a sense of how this process worked, I'd like to comment on a couple of these case studies. So for the sake of time, I'll focus on examples drawn from two writers' novels, uh, Nabokov and Sakhalov. Uh, but of course, I'd be happy to discuss uh, the others, if I'm missing anyone's favorites, um, and their interpretations of Joyce during the, the Q&A at the end. So Nabokov first. Um, in November 1933, Nabokov wrote to Joyce with an offer to translate Ulysses. What motivated the young artist to brave such an immense undertaking? Nabokov's Ulysses, a staggering feat of translation, is a traditional Kunstler Roman torn asunder by mirroring devices and nested stories. 
Its hero, an untested writer, fears and seeks fulfillment in his paternal relationships. He furthermore attempts to find his place in an oppressively foreign land. In typically iconoclastic manner, Nabulk of derived the original title for his translation from a curious source, Ulysses' famous final line, that famous affirmation at the end of Molly's, uh, Molly Bloom's soliloquy, yes, da, dar. So Nabokov would extend this dialogue with his Irish predecessor in his second English language novel, Ben Sinister, where he critiques Joyce's treatment of his ancestor, Shakespeare, in Ulysses, and creates a kind of three-part uh, conversation um, argument. And the two together, his would-be Ulysses translation, Dar, the Gift, this is his final Russian novel, um, and Ben Sinister, his second English language novel, function as a kind of combined critical commentary on influence and intertextist translation on haunting legacies. What Nabokov offers in his works is an answer to how writers might productively deal with literary ghosts of the past, whether they be biological fathers, Pushkin, Joyce, or even projects abandoned but not forgotten, like this Ulysses translation. The central principle of the gift of Dar uh, involves Fyodor's merging of his father, Konstantin Kirillovich, the biological figure Stephen called a necessary evil in Ulysses, with Alexander Pushkin, father of modern Russian letters. Uh, Pushkin entered Fyodor's blood, the narrator writes, with Pushkin's voice merged the voice of his father. What Fyodor, um, Nabokov's, we can say, semi-autobiographical narrator, attempts uh, through writing his father's biography after the latter's disappearance um, on an expedition goes far beyond his expectations and extends the limits of his artistry. This project bears similarity, if in a refracted form, to the ideas proposed by Stephen in episode nine of Ulysses, a case of mistranslation on Nabokov's part. He's using the same ideas. He's interpreting them and translating them in his context, but with a twist. Fyodor, unlike Stephen, wishes to unite the biological with the literary, the filial with the artistic. For him, reclaiming a literary tradition by uniting it with his personal and family histories means overturning his exile, the revolution, and recovering his deceased father, who comes to stand for a culture now inaccessible to him in, in exile. The relationship clearly contrasts with that of Stephen, whose father, he feels, he completely understands, failures and all. And, and uh, to whom he has access still. Nabokov's swerve away from Joyce's text emphasizes precisely these crucial differences in his interpretive translation. Nabokov thus manipulates the same ideas, selecting one's ancestors, allusions in Fyodor's biography project and in the Shakespeare speech that link various father figures, life and work, um, as if blending them. But writing from uh, an undesirable exile, he deviates from the div divisionary component inherent to Joyce's endeavor. One uh, relevant arresting image appears in the fifth chapter, the final chapter of the gift, when Fyodor finds a dog's corpse in Berlin's uh, Grunwald forest. Here is a dark thicket of small firs where I once discovered a pit which had been carefully dug out before its death by the creature that lay therein, a young slender muzzled dog of wolf ancestry folded into a wonderfully graceful curve. This detail has its Joycean source, uh, one to which Nabokov drew his students' attention in his lectures to Ulysses. He emphasizes it to some extent. Early in Joyce's novel, Stephen exam examines, excuse me, the bloated carcass of a dog on the shore of Sandy Mount in, in uh, Dublin. And after witnessing another uh, canine sniff the body, he thinks, ah, poor dog's body. Here lies poor dog's body's body. And finally, the dog's owner um, calls him. The cry brought him skulking back to his master, and a blunt, uh, blunt bootless kick sent him unscathed across the pit of, spit of sand crouched in flight. He slunk back in a curve. Two primary concerns overwhelm Stephen here. The relentless pressure of time and the possibility that he too is a pretender. The hydrophobic Stephen recalls how his roommate Buck in the morning called him poor dog's body. He sees only decay in what he discovers. And uh, of course, there is uh, much less grace in the sight of this bloated carcass than in the peaceful wolf-like dog. Nonetheless, uh, he, um, Stephen, wishes to reinvent himself to avoid becoming another victim in, uh, of history, another son drowned by Ireland's pull. 
The sight of the other dog's master, moreover, reinforces Stephen's anxieties about his identity. In his gift, Nabokov creates an association to this scene, whereas Stephen's dog curves as a response to his master's kick, Fyodor's dog lies in a graceful curve, suggesting a peaceful state. Likewise, Fyodor notes that the dog was of wolf ancestry, and in doing so, he raises the issue of lineage that motivates so much of his thinking. This creature symbolizes Fyodor's belief in an elect line. Fyodor's epiphany allows him to recognize the links to the past that are preserved by his art, and he no longer fears death um, as he once did, but instead recognizes artistic means to overcome it, at least his, his father's or his father's memory. Oh, excuse me. Um, these kinds of ideas and images run throughout the gift as they do in Ulysses. And shifting gears a little bit now, Ben Sinister also treats the question of fathers and sons through its skewed perspective and offers insights into how uh, da, dar fits in Nabokov's extended response to Joyce. Most notably um, in this novel, this dystopian novel, Nabokov's protagonist Krug and his friend Ember hold a conversation in the seventh chapter um, that speaks directly to Stephen's Shakespearean ruminations and the theory, this conversation he has in the library in episode nine of Ulysses. Um, in such scenes in Ben Sinister, Joyce permeates the narrative uh, through links to the bard, yet another literary father. So Volkov is responding to Joyce through Shakespeare, partly in what Joyce had said about Shakespeare. The connection is, is established when, after describing a series of three engravings on Ember's wall, the narrator, referring to Shakespeare, says that, quote, his name is Protean, end quote, um, an, an allusion as well to the name of Ulysses' third chapter in Stephen's cogitations on time and an identity within. These engravings point to, uh, quote, Gustavus Selunus's, Selunus's uh, study of cryptographic systems reproduced in Edwin, uh, Ed, excuse me, Edwin Durning Lawrence's Bacon is Shakespeare, um, as Brian Bo Boyd notes. Nabokov establishes his parody of scholarly perversions by which the author's life is mishandled, art poisoned by extra literary considerations. Fyodor had been offered as a response to this approach when he refuses to do the same with his father, uh, to treat him and Pushkin as literary objects in the gift. Um, uh, Fyodor stops writing the, bi the biography. He, he stops at a certain point. What Krug and Stephen do to Shakespeare, though, goes against Nabokov's aesthetics of the father. Reading retroactively, we see how Nabokov viewed Stephen's treatment of Hamlet and Shakespeare's life as an oversimplification of the creative process, bringing Krug's and Fyodor's fates to sharper relief. For his part, Krug raises his spirits after his wife dies with uh, such ribald readings of Hamlet akin to Stephen's obsession with Anne Hathaway's alleged infidelity and Shakespeare's encoding of the story into the play. For example, recounting uh, what he calls the Hawkman's plan for a film adaptation of Hamlet to Ember, Krug reports, um, and then there was Ophelia's death. She would be shown wrestling, or as another river maid's father, Joyce, uh, would have said, rustling with the willow, alas, a salix. This entire scene and some that follow um, is a wonderful concentration of intertext. There's the river maid's father, a reference to Finnegan's Wake's Joyce and on Olivia Pluribel, the, the female figure in the book associated with rivers, um, and the Joycean wordplay in wrestling, rustling, and alas, Salix. This passage and the general conversation um, make Krug, Stephen, and by extension Joyce culpable in a game of crass quasi literary one upmanship. Fyodor, though, refuses uh, to hunt down his fancies on his father's own collecting ground, opting out of such a game. So what goes on between Krug and Ember can be seen as a further travestied version of what Stephen accomplishes in Ulysses and, as a result, what Fyodor nearly does in the gift by distorting his father's life, as well as Pushkin's, with its own poetics and interests. We can say that Stephen, in a sense, commits two chief aesthetic crimes according to Nabokov's literary penal code. First, he willingly inserts himself and his concerns into the life of Shakespeare. He chooses, to quote the gift, uh, to shuffle, twist, mix, rechew, and rebelch everything in order to construct an image of Shakespeare according to his needs. Fyodor does something similar when he equates elements of Pushkin's poetry and his kind of uh, literary mentorship with his father. There are critical differences though. Fyodor's scheme brings together the fathers. His undertaking elevates his own position as chosen son, but he still reveres the fathers. 
Fielder transposes elements of Pushkin's art onto his father's life, not vice versa, preserving the poet's glory. In translating Ulysses for his Russian immigrant community, Nabokov had to adjust for such ghosts of the recent past. Um, and this is a key term, ghosts, uh, one that should be understood broadly. Uh, and ghosts themselves are ubiquitous in Nabokov's art. This has been said many times. Um, Fyodor's dream encounter in the gift with the ghost of Konstantin Kirillovich, his father, represents a positive resolution to this generation, uh, these generational tensions. Fyodor experiences the dream in which he's called to meet an unexpected guest near the end, uh, novel's end um, uh, and establishes a parallel with Stephen's vision of his mother's corpse. The ghoul, uh, hyena, the corpse chewer, raw head and blood bones. Fyodor is bewildered to find himself face to face with Konstantin Kirillovich. As much as Fyodor craves such a resurrection, he also dreads the possibility. His heart was bursting like that of a man before execution, but at the same time, this execution was such a joy that life faded before it. The meeting is an execution as it's the conclusion of all that's come before it. The young Fyodor's artistic maturation and aching hope for his father's return. It's likewise a final judgment. Here, Fielder's vision of his father will decide his fate, rendering him mute, creatively mute, or allowing him to flourish as a writer. Fielder knows that his father must have perished on his journey home from Central Asia, yet the plausibility of his return haunts him. The fear possessing Fielder passes, though, when his father speaks to him, an act that reveals, quote, that he was pleased, pleased with his captures, his return, his son's book about him, end quote. Fyodor's encounter with the ghost of his father stands in stark contrast to Krug's with his murdered son, David's body. Um, spoiler alert, alert, it happens near the end of the book. Um, uh, and this body, this, this child's body is rendered a literally exquisite corpse by the regime. Um, uh, or blooms uh, with a vision of his deceased son, Rudy, it's in contrast to it. Uh, it simultaneously generates immensely different results uh, than Hamlet's meeting with the king. Uh, but some shared details between these various scenes deserve special note. Nabokov's anthropomorphic deity at the end of Bent Sinister, uh, this figure that appears um, and is a kind of stand-in uh, for, for himself, the author, uh, wields an inclined beam of light to deliver instantaneous madness to the protagonist. While in The Gift, the narrator comments that light broke through uh, during Fielder's reunion with his father, putting him at ease. This light then is associated with clarity. Krug may go mad, but he also understands that he's only a creation of a mind beyond his world, Nabokov himself, he's just a character. Hamlet and Krug are set on a destructive path due to their respective paranormal encounters. Stephen, like Bloom, is bombarded with reminders of the past that shake him. His mother's corpse, English cultural and political dominion, and the very weight of literary history. Fyodor, on the contrary, discovers a unity in the world he'd had trouble discerning. Quote, pondering now fate's methods, he finally found a certain thread, a hidden spirit for his as yet hardly planned novel. He takes on the mantle of the artist, son, creator in a manner that tacitly combats Stephen's practice in Ulysses with its acceptance of the father. Even if Nabokov's proposed translation of Ulysses came to naught, we can consider his gift, his da, his da, a transposition of Joyce's book. Some aspects of, jo of Ulysses find their mirror image. Stephen wishes to go back into exile in Europe, like Joyce did, uh, while Fyodor laments the loss of his homeland. Other parts of Ulysses, the hero's aesthetic theories, representative motifs, the fascination with paternity, come through in less altered forms. Nabokov's Ulysses delights in the process of revising a predecessor's work for its own personal and historical context, that of Russian immigration in Berlin. It cannot be a translation more faithful to the original. Instead, Nabokov delivers the spirit of Ulysses, a protean work that refuses to be neatly defined and interpreted in a time, during a time, when sons were severing uh, paternal ties. Turning now to Sokolov, the, the subject of this, uh, uh, the second subject of this talk, um, we can consider a different moment in Joyce's Russian odyssey. In a 2011 interview, the author recounts that he read Joyce along, uh, alongside Stein, Whitman, Apollinaire. Um, he adds that the formal innovations he sought weren't to be found in writers such as Salinger or Faulkner. Furthermore, aiming to establish his status as a true cosmopolitan, we might say, 
Sokolov elevates Western writers over Russians. Joyce and company are more important to me than Platonov, Andrei Platonov. The innovations that he focuses on or mentions here are, are key for, unlike many previous writers, Sokolov's Joycean influence took root in his style. All three of Sokolov's books are notoriously difficult to summarize, each in its own way. Um, a School for Fools, excuse me, pictured here, established this pattern by breaking with many norms of fiction, perhaps reflecting the hero's condition as a, as a man, uh, referred to as student so-and-so, a young man, um, uh, with mental issues, Sokolov's debut lacks a clear chronology, and numerous characters are imbued with different personas. The action mostly takes place either at the student's dacha community or at his school. His parents act as foils, particularly his father, who makes students so-and-so copy articles from Soviet newspapers as a cruel re-education. The hero also spends time with his, uh, spends his time pining for Vieta Akatova, a teacher and daughter of a scientist who lives nearby. But all of this is not so simple, not, not in reality. Uh, the protagonist imas imagines the passage of time as a simultaneity in which he can drop his consciousness into any moment of his life. Thus, contradictory situations occur frequently. Um, chapter two likewise breaks expectations as the narrative shifts and is dispersed among 12 short vignettes, um, not unlike uh, chapter episode 10 of Ulysses Wandering Rocks that shows different perspectives. Um, and it's within this atypical novel that Sokolov engages in his Joycean revolution of the word. One key stratagem uh, Sokolov and Joyce share is what's usually termed stream of consciousness. In uh, this first case, in the first case of this prototypically modernist technique from School for Fools, which you see here, and apologize, it's a lot of uh, words, but it gives you a sense of what's going on. Um, student so-and-so's narrative morphs into an even looser form of its already frenzied state. Here, his words serve as an incantation that brings the character Vieta into existence. In Sokolov's hand, stream of consciousness functions as a means to explore the connections um, the mind creates and the rhythm of thoughts themselves and the way they can appear on the page. Um, on another level, Sokolov adapts this technique from Joyce as a means of escape from fossilized forms. Amid the calls, the continued calls for art that concerns itself with social questions and places an emphasis on content, Sokolov turned to modernist prototypes. Incidentally, in an interview with Olga Matic, uh, Sokolov proposes, not without a hint of self-defense, um, that he learned a great deal from the, quote, modernist Lev Tolstoy, who, quote, used stream of consciousness as a device long before Joyce. True as this may be, Sokolov's stream of consciousness looks like Joyce's much more than Tolstoy's or even Faulkner's, let's say. Um, it is, a, as it were, a, a parody of the modernist stream of consciousness and its self-aware recognition of the inter interdependence of writing and thought, um, an engagement with that predecessor style, predecessor style. Um, here, language itself, rather than plot or character, furthermore dictates uh, the novel's progression. The railway branch Severnaya Vietka transforms into a, into a branch of an acacia tree, Vietka Akatsi, and finally into the multifaceted character Vieta, teacher, railway prostitute, and beloved and daughter. While Joyce's heroine Molly uh, doesn't perform the same, not the same kind of linguistic sorcery, her soliloquy, the final chapter of Ulysses, features similar jumps in thought. Then you have to look out of the window all the nicer. Then coming back, suppose I never came back, what would they say? Elope with him, that gets you on, on the stage. The last concert I sang at, where? It's over a year ago, when was it? St. Teresa's Hall. But in Finnegan's Wake, this principle can be found in nearly every page. Dogging you round Cove and Haven and teaching me the perts of speech. If you spun your warns to him on the swish bark waves, I was spelling my urines to her over cottage cake. Will not disturb their sleeping duties. Let be, be sums be bossoms. It's Phoenix, dear, and the flame is here. Puns, homonyms, suggestive roots, and all sorts of sound play build up the impression of a text that has become both overwhelmed by the power of language itself and self-consciously captivated by its own possibilities, much as in A School for Fools. Um, the major difference I'd say is uh, that Sokolov is not as interested in multilingual play like Joyce. If Sokolov disrupts plot and language in such myriad ways, his approach to character is no less iconoclastic. One of the most distinctive aspects of Sokolov's art that's been noted many times is his use of uh, forking characters, that is characters who blend between different identities. 
Such play with character occupies a greater role in his second novel, Between Dog and Wolf, and in Joyce's Finnegan's Wake, but its roots can be observed in uh, both authors' earlier novels, too. In the contrast between uh, the halves of the student's mind, student so-and-so, um, the artistic, free-spirited individual and the more demanding identity that tries valiantly to tame the more spirited side, we see echoes of the relationship between brothers Shem the penman and Sean the postman in Finnegan's Wake. Um, and descriptions of this dialectic by Colin McCabe in Finnegan's Wake uh, could very well apply to the student. As McCabe writes, uh, quote, Sean accuses Shem of refusing to be a proper member of society. Shem is accused of being a forger, constantly imitating others in his writing. His pride goes together with an absolute refusal to join in um, the patriotic struggle which would offer him the chance of achieving true manhood. Instead, he prefers to occupy himself with the affairs of women, end quote. The more obedient half of the student's mind questions the other's flights of imagination and tries to temper his creativity with references to reality and authority. The patriotic struggle mentioned in this description uh, in the case of School for Fools concerns the standards of Soviet society, something the student fails to uphold in every regard. Less successful than Shem in romance, the student still devotes a great deal of his narrative to women, particularly Vieta, and expresses an urgent desire to understand sex. Both authors, though, complicate matters by constantly merging and splitting the two figures. In the wake, Joyce's uh, brothers, the brother figures, fight and fight, and yet they become one. With this laudable purpose and loud ability, let us be single, single-fied. The student, too, experiences moments of complete internal discord. Oh, I was mistaken, sir. That one, the other one, dreams of becoming an engineer, as well as of agreement. But why did you pluck it? Of course I shouldn't have. I didn't want to. Believe me. In Ulysses, uh, Scylla and Charybdis, episode nine, Stephen proposes that a person's character shifts and constantly reflects back on itself as it takes, uh, takes on new self-created iterations. Every life is many days, day after day. We walk through ourselves meeting robbers, ghosts, giants, old men, young men, wives, widows, brothers in love, but always meeting ourselves. This insight, of course, plays a role in his Shakespeare theory, which is tied closely to his conception of art as a vessel for the creation of one's identity. Student so-and-so explicates a similar idea near the novel's end. The song of years, the melody of life, all the rest is not you, all the others are alien. Who are you yourself? You'll only find out later, stringing the beads of memory, consisting of them, you yourself will be memory. Reduced to the state of being, one need only piece together recollections artistically reconceived to fashion a personality, whether it draws on the efforts of one's predecessors or not. Elsewhere though, Stephen and the student consider the world external to their memory and mind and come to different conclusions. Walking along the beach, Stephen closes his eyes to pay uh, attention to the noises around him. He notes various sounds, worries about falling, and ultimately turns his gaze to his surroundings. Open your eyes now, has all vanished since? If I open and am forever in the black at the infinite, basta, I will see if I can see, see now. There all the time without you and ever shall be world without end. Stephen learns two things here. First, simply he comes to appreciate the world of the audible more deeply. Second, and more importantly, once he opens his eyes and recognizes the beach around him, uh, the fact that the world exists independently of his consciousness strikes him with full force. Sokolov includes a similar episode in school's first chapter. Having taken several steps along the beach, I looked back. Nothing resembling my tracks remained on the sand, and nevertheless, I still did not want to believe. You never know as it happens. First, it could turn out that it's all a dream. Second, it's possible that the sand here is extraordinarily firm, and I, weighing a total of only so many kilograms, did not leave tracks in it because of my lightness. And third, it is quite probable that I didn't disembark from the boat onto the shore yet, but to this point still sit in it, and naturally, I could not leave tracks where I had not yet been. While Stephen's realization that external reality doesn't depend on his perception frustrates his ego, the student examines the sand for proof of his existence and finds none, yet his response is not despair but amusement. Setting aside the fact that the scene, along with everything else in the novel, is imagined by the student, Sokolov emphasizes the transient nature of reality, art, and character in this uh, allusion to Joyce's novel. If Stephen's certainty in structures and the artist's vision is at least temporarily disturbed by the incident on the beach, then the student's disillusion comes into sharper focus. 
he leaves no marks in the sand, only on the page, dissolving, as it were, into the truly protean stylistic texture of language and non-plot. Um, continuing the, the discussion of identity, uh, the student has a third identity um, called those who came. Um, and this also subverts Joyce in a way. Limited to five references in school, this nickname, nickname brings to mind Joyce's Here Comes Everybody from Finnegan's Wake. Um, this is the most famous of the, what we can maybe call the protagonist of Finnegan's Wake, Humphrey Chimpton Earwicker, uh, his most famous moniker. Um, and Here Comes Everybody represents his universal character. Um, uh, he's a complete embodiment of Joyce's extreme ap approach to character development. He's everyone within and without the book. He takes many identities, historical, mythological, uh, historical, all sorts of things, as do all the other characters. In School for Fools, the student elatedly speaks of the name, those who came. And whenever we came, they said about us, look, there they are, those who came, greedy for knowledge, daring lovers of truth. In both Joyce and Sokolov, these names, uh, HCE, TWC, represent a generalized presence. Here, Sokolov inverts the Joycean original with his character's name, suggesting a terminal point of development, uh, those who came, but also challenging any definitive solution to the problem of primacy. Thus, those who came is or are the result of here comes everybody, a take on character that universalizes and breaks apart identity. Devoid of any firm foundation in time, TWC live in the present, arrived, existing, they came. This conception of a character without past or future emphasizes Sokolov's guiding interest in escaping from any kind of conflict with literary history. As the all in all and totally present, TWC need not find a precedent like Stephen. To take one more uh, quick related example, how the two writers play with time speaks to similarities in their worldviews. In school, Sokolov grammaticalizes the student's wandering mind by having him write in all three uh, tenses, which you can see here. Um, uh, floating, well, uh, sorry, was floating and floating, will float, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this process, moreover, allows him to die, live, and repeatedly return to life as he can experience all moments at once. Joyce uses the same formulation. Teams of times and happy returns, the same anew, Ordovico and Vircordo, Anna was, Livia is, Pluribel's to be. Their characters, student so-and-so and Anna, Livia, Pluribel, live multiple lives as they're born and reborn in the narrative uh, fabric in various forms, identities. Through this construction, time loses meaning and humanity gains universality and immortality. History simply does not interest me, Sokolov once said in an interview. I don't believe that you can extract the future from it. This foregrounding of the present is central to Joyce's thought as well. Discussing his final novel, the Irishman stated, there is no past, no future. Everything flows in an eternal present. We see the same in his fiction. In Ulysses, a novel dealing with a single day's events, Molly's soliloquy at the end reflects her immediate thoughts, her menstrual cycle, her singing career, her husband. Um, and yet, uh, these thoughts constantly reevaluate the past, suggesting her inability to overcome her love for the flawed blue. In Finnegan's Wake, Vico's theory of circular history structures the narrative as events. Uh, HCE's alleged crime of exposing himself, among other options, uh, are retold in different uh, guises. History seems to be taking place alongside the present, as all these uh, events are, are occurring. Finally, in A School for Fools, the student's narrative uh, narrative is obsessed with the present moment, and yet the circularity of the novel is difficult to miss. So these are two case studies in the linear history of Joyce's impact on Russian letters. They describe how Joyce progressively entered and changed Russian literature. However, the Joyce in Russia story might also be properly calibrated with an explicit awareness of the fertility of borrowings and of Joycean intertextuality. Reading intertextually necessarily involves recognizing literary history, one prerequisite for which is a working assumption that history can be recounted and interpreted in a coherent manner. This position isn't to be surrendered, I don't think. Much can be learned regarding the text and context of writers spotlighted from this perspective. However, the first thing to consider is the possibility that there's something intrinsically oppositional in the position of a writer vis-a-vis -vis history. 
Each Russian author's reading of Joyce speaks not only to their understanding of his work, but also to their efforts to situate themselves within shifting historical factors and legacies, as well as an evol evolving comprehension of intertextual relations. The writer's struggle with history, according to this line of reasoning, is an attempted liberation from a worldview that stifles one's current reality with concerns about the past. When Stephen calls history a nightmare from which he is trying to wake, he has in mind the hold of the past embodied by his parents, England, and Catholicism. He also means the weight of literature that looms over him as a young artist. Ulysses then represents a working through of these ideas as Stephen attempts to shake free from the, hold, uh, the, uh, the stranglehold of this multitude of fathers, both literal and figurative, by means of a Shakespeare theory. And numerous Russian writers with their own historical baggage eagerly turn to this theme in his work. But the writers and historians craft is also essentially dependent on their worldviews. We might then imagine what a polyphonic approach to a history that's not yet concluded can yield, especially if applied to more recent materials in the Russian Joyce story. How has Joyce come to be read in the last 30 years? What does he represent to the latest generations of writers, critics, and readers? How do they conceive of his influence, that naughty word, um, now that he's, especially now that he's been successfully reincorporated into the canon? So uh, and we'll zoom in. You don't have to read this small text. Uh, for my book's conclusion, I interviewed a number of authors to get a sense of this alternate Joyce in Russia story, one that's more open-ended, chaotic in a, in a sense, as yet unfixed. Um, so here are a few of their responses. Uh, first, how writers encountered Joyce. Um, a couple, Marina Stepnova and Anna Glazova, uh, spoke to me of the physical response Joyce elicited in, in them, the kind of power his words held over them. Um, and then Ivan Sokolov, Berkeley Connection, uh, who's of a, a younger generation, suggested that even by his time, Joyce was commonplace, something found on his parents' bookshelf, something he deeply appreciated, but didn't have the same sort of relationship um, that it did for previous writers. Um, and you see kind of the nuances here as well. Another key theme in our conversations were the connections between Russian literature and Joyce. Um, some view him as a foreign continuation of the Russian tradition. Alexei Salnikov, the author of Petrovi v Kripi v Kruk Nivo, the Petrov's In and Around the Flu, um, told me, in some ways, Joyce affirmed the right of the Russian classics. I have in mind Dostoevsky and Tolstoy to write verbosely, long-windedly, with a strong focus on details, leaving the plot somewhere to the side of the whole enormous narrative. So it's a kind of retroactive permission uh, for uh, Dostoevsky and Tolstoy. Dmitry Bukov, um, as some of you may know, one of Russia's most well-known writers and critics, or formerly of Russia, uh, found something even more experimental in Joyce's art, even if its origins come from Tolstoy. For me, Joyce is the founder of total realism, which touches on all aspects of being, from the religious to the physiological. He's Tolstoy's main successor, and he pulled off Tolstoy's dream of producing a detailed description of a fictional person's day. Oh. Whoa. Okay. Um, we note, too, how these writers view the connection between Joyce's work and the Soviet experience in quite different ways. For example, Sergei Solovyov, who incidentally um, translated Joyce's uh, uh, naughty, <laughs> erotic letters to his wife, Nora, uh, into Russian in a kind of poetic form. Uh, Solovyov uses a Golden Fleece Odyssey comparison to suggest that Soviet writers could relate to Ulysses given the mythological, teleological underpinnings of the Soviet project. Um, on the other hand, or in a different vein, uh, Zinovi Zinik uh, instead addresses the in-betweenness of Ulysses and Soviet life, the question of finding one's own true identity, and that this, this question of identity uh, that's central to Ulysses in, in various ways um, would speak to the Soviet writer or, or the Russian writer, um, a reader, um, and, and would bring them into to Joyce's world. It's clear, of course, that the story of Joyce in Russia remains in motion, despite his official canonization within the Russian sphere. What we can pull from these statements and others is how Joyce became and continues to be emblematic of a desire for freedom. This freedom has taken various forms, but undergirding many of them is the hope to combat a historical narrative that restricts the artist's identity. Men out of time, early Soviet writers, uh, such as Alyesha saw in Joyce's work a solution to their precarious state as individualist artists in the newly formed Soviet Union. Their turn to the Western Joyce was a complicated one, not always successful, um, to say the least. 
Meanwhile, emigres such as Popolovsky and Nabokov sought to recover the past that the 1917 revolution had taken from them by translating Joyce's works and his aesthetic theories into their context. Post-Stalinist writers such as Bitov opted to disengage from the war with the past, seeing the futility of doing so um, and, and taking a more playful approach, decorating their works with Joyce's texts and others. Um, while even later writers, Sokolov among them, finally broke through and accessed Joyce as a stylistic um, touchstone. And for the post-Soviet era, turning to Joyce means reconnecting Russian literature with the tradition it had been separated from officially for so long from modernism. This contact fuels the novels of the Russian Joycians, and in their engagement with the Irish writers' theories, they found much to shape their own visions and responses uh, to the world around them. But this transformation cuts both ways. Strong writers, as Harold Bloom says in his controversial Western canon, have the wit to transform their forerunners into composite and therefore partly imaginary beings. Indeed, Joyce became a remarkably plastic symbol for those Russian writers who viewed him as a crucial element in their escape from oppressive histories. Fluctuating political, cultural, and personal realities would dictate how exactly they could read Joyce, literally and figuratively, yet they found in his writings the means to beget their own lineage through the literary word. And so his work in progress continues on Russian soil. Thank you. Thank you, Jose. Um, I, Thank you, Zach. Very interesting just to, I guess, to go beyond like what I know, Russian literature, Soviet literature, and now Russian literature again. Um, for everyone, like this is Jose's book here. And for the fun of it, I'm going to be starting Joyce myself, um, Ulysses, because it is, as you said, one of those books everyone seems to know, but no one seems to have read. And I like to be the person who's read the book that no one seems to read. Um, as a, um, before I get started, I'm gonna ask a question shortly, but I would welcome anyone um, to use the Q&A chat box. It's on the lower right-hand side of the screen um, to input your question. Um, but I will start to give some time so that people can formulate those. Um, Jose, I wanted to ask, so PhD Slavic, you are a professor of Russian literature, I'm curious, in the chicken and egg idea, which came first, Russian literature, or Ulysses, and Joyce? For you to have now come to this, like, was it an undergrad exposure to Joyce, and then you went to Russian mm -hmm. lit? Um, curious, like, kind of to contextualize where this sits yeah. for you. Yeah, the origins. Um, I suppose technically, it was about the same. Um, <laughs> in high school, I read Dostoevsky, Crime and Punishment, and the book of Lolita. Um, and tried to read Ulysses and didn't make it through. Um, I, I, I gave up in, after the initial <laughs> uh, Stephen chapters. It, you know, it was too much at that moment, or I had other things going on, I'll say. Um, but I came back to it after I had started studying Russian and Russian literature in college and did an independent study uh, with uh, an amazing professor, Tim Langen. Um, and we actually read uh, Ulysses, uh, together alongside uh, a couple Bieli novels, Andre Bieli, we read Petersburg and The White Dove, um, and uh, uh, At Swim Two Birds by Flann O'Brien, another amazing Irish writer. Um, so I think uh, ultimately all of this is kind of intertwined for me. I have this fascination and love for, for Joyce that really took root once I was able to read him with something else. And I think that's the best way to, to read. Uh, Joyce and Ulysses. So I, I welcome conversations with you when you start <laughs> going through Ulysses. Um, uh, and yeah, from, from there is, you know, uh, once I realized uh, that this subject, this, you know, kind of longer scale uh, or, or bigger scale, uh, longer term study of Joyce and Russian literature hadn't been done, it seemed like a really appealing and natural uh, fit for my research mm -hmm. um, and, and pursued it from there. Yeah. Very nice. Um, no, thank you. I mean, it's just, you know, I know you as a Russianist or ACs, so to kind of have this outside figure be this moving force that kind of brings a bunch of different people together who write very differently and yet similar in different fashions. Um, mm. Just interesting. It, it, it's like an outsider looking in an outside theme that applies very well. So we have some questions that came in. Um, one, they're in a couple of different spots, <clears throat> some in the chat, some in the Q&A. Um, yep. But the first one, thank you, Jose, for this wonderful, rich, wonderfully rich talk. I couldn't help noticing that Stephen Dedalus's 
um, name appeared in your talk about 50 times more than Leopold Bloom's, does Bloom essentially get edited out of the Russian intertextual Ulysses? In the gift, might one say that Bloom is turned into or pre-incarnated as Chernyshevsky? Uh, thank you, Eric, for the, the kind words and the question and, and, the, and the fun reading there. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think in, in this talk, I was very much focused, or this, this version of this talk focused on um, the, the son's half, right, and the son's struggle to find fathers and, and working through these issues, and that's a, a big part of the, the project in the book. Um, Bloom does figure into to the response um, in different ways, just to give two quick examples. In um, Aliesha's Zavist Envy, um, the short novel from 1927, the focus of the, the first chapter of the book. Um, there I read Andrei Babichev, um, a, a Nep era man, a, a early businessman uh, in the Soviet era, um, as a Bloom figure. So it, the novel, as many of you know, uh, some of you know, uh, opens with uh, Andrei Babachev going to the bathroom, bathing himself, uh, defecating, um, <laughs> and uh, and so on. And, and it parallels very closely the, the morning scene that Ulysses opens with, as well as Leopold Bloom's visit to the outhouse um, in one of his first chapters. Um, um, and I see that as a kind of working through of the, the father figures there and, and that association with Ulysses. Um, and then in, in Bita, for instance, uh, in Pushkin House, Pushkin Sidom, um, there's a character, uh, Blank, Blanc, uh, who's a you know, kind of mentor at Pushkin House, this research institute for the protagonist there. Um, and there's another kind of library conversation and there he also uh, sort of performs the, the Bloomian role, um, a kind of mentor that's denied by the son. Um, and in the conversation too, there's this exchange that, again, uh, it's strikingly similar to, to what happens in Ulysses. Um, Bloom has an exchange with uh, the citizen, this nationalist um, figure at a pub, um, and in their, their quarrel as they're leaving, uh, as Bloom is, is fleeing, um, he names a bunch of people, uh, historical figures who, who were Jewish uh, to stand up for um, uh, the Jewish people. And in the, the final one he names uh, is, is God. And his God was also Jewish, uh, the citizens. Um, and um, in Pushing House, this has turned into, again, um, a kind of debate about race and, and origins and uh, uh, in that conversation, Pushkin takes that place as well. So there's this funny um, exchange there. So he, Bloom, uh, definitely figures into the intertextual conversation between Russian literature and um, and Joyce. I just didn't necessarily focus it on uh, focus on it here. Um, and in the gift, might one say that Bloom is turned into or pre-incarnated as Chernyshevsky? Um, yeah, I, I, that that uh, as I said, I think that'd be a fun reading and. Um, I think in line with the, the reading backwards sort of approach. Um, and I'll, I'll definitely think about that some more, but yeah, I think the, the sort of, I don't know, maybe uh, Nabokov, I think in the narrator is ultimately at least somewhat sympathetic to Chernyshevsky and his plight, but um, not in the same way that Joyce is for, for Bloom. Um, but yeah, there's something to look at there. Excellent, thank you. Thank you again. So there's another, I guess, comment question. So I understand mm -hmm. that Joyce and Nabokov met once at a reading, but they were not personally impressed and they had a banal meeting. Have you read any information about that? Do you have any insight to add to that? Yeah, and um, I, if I can pull it up quickly, I can put a um, bibliographic information in, in the chat. There's, a, there's an article that, that kind of goes into that in more detail. Um, but yeah, their first meeting was actually uh, a lecture that, that Nabokov uh, was scheduled to deliver uh, at the last minute, and he was giving this lecture on, on Pushkin, um, and uh, in the audience was the Hungarian so soccer team, so not the audience he was expecting, and not, you know, it was a comedy of errors, no one <laughs> was supposed to be there, uh, but he, Nabokov describes, right, this looking out into the audience who's not necessarily very receptive and he sees Joyce's um, uh, uh, 
glinting eyeglasses. He just sees Joyce sitting there cross-legged. Um, so they met there, but they actually they had some mutual acquaintances um, in Paris and, and met a few more times. Um, there's an account of, uh, of a dinner and how they um, uh, talked about the how to make miodes and uh, not miod, um not honey. Uh, uh, I'm blanking. A, a drink, some some kind of drink, um, and different reports about this dinner uh, uh, describe different accounts of what what people said. Um, so yeah, they 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 seem to have um, uh, gone in along. Didn't you know? He didn't end up translating. Ulysses didn't end up having um, uh, very close professional ties, let's say, or, or personal ones. But um, through these mutual acquaintances, they had some some crossover in in um, uh, in Paris. Interesting. Um, makes the world small. Also, kind of shows maybe yeah. globalization starting at that small, or at that era right before we really got air travel and all that. So we have another question. Um, the first edition of Bielis Petersburg, um, 1913, appeared before Ulysses, yet the two texts have some aspects in common. An example, tram in motion with rhythmically and conceptually, uh, both rhythmically and conceptually. Another example, starting and stopping. When did Ulysses first appear in Russian? So the first trans partial translation um, that I mentioned was 1925, uh, and that was snippets, bits of a uh, chapter, uh, various chapters um, from the beginning and then the end, um, and some in the middle. Um, that was in uh, Leningrad and Moscow, um, and then in the late 20s, early 30s, up to 20 or 30, I can tell you exactly, one sec. Um, I can even show you, I meant. By all means. Here we go, yeah. So 1925 was this, whoa, 1925 was uh, the first one, these fragments. Um, and then uh, more Joyce started appearing in the late 20s, early 30s. Uh, there was an attempt at translating Ulysses in the mid 30s, but with 37, essentially everything shut down. Um, and then not until the late eighties was a full translation serialized and published in book form in 93. Um, let's stop sharing. So yeah, and uh, apparently the story goes, the accounts we have is that uh, Joyce and uh, Bielli did know of each other, knew each other's work, but didn't actually read it. Um, so these, you know, odd um, parallels connections between the two works are just, just chance. There wasn't any, uh, allegedly any any uh, connections between the two. Uh, what are the similarities between Bielli and Joyce? The ones that people note, um, and um, Neil Cornwell has a book, uh, James Joyce and the Russians, um, published in the early 90s. And there he's looking primarily at um, the critical reception of Joyce, again, primarily in Soviet criticism, Soviet journals, newspapers. Um, but he has a section that looks at Joyce and Eisenstein, um, Bielli and Nabokov, but only briefly all three of these. Um, so the ones that people have brought up is uh, certainly the play with language that, that you mentioned, um, Olga, um, the, the rhythmic, um, I don't know, the awareness of, of language and the musicality of, of, uh, of language in both Ulysses and Finnegan's Wake. Um, it, the fact that there's city novels that take place in you know these short periods of time, um, the father-son connections as well. I think the, the tensions between the generations um, is something people have uh, have focused on. Um, yeah, and you know, in, in my research, I was interested in the twenties and beyond and kind of direct connections between the two. Um, but there's a few. Uh, articles or at least references to potential um, intertextual connections or, or parallels, let's say, because they didn't read each other, apparently. Interesting. Um, I remember reading Bailey on a bus between O'Hare and Madison way back at the end of undergrad. Um, you had mentioned earlier just sharing some bibliographic information, and there was a request to say if you could share that. I don't know if, is there a link or 
Um, I would have to pull up the bibliography, but I can do it. <laughs> um, I had a question, I guess, to kind of go with the translation idea. Um, and hopefully this won't be too taxing, but you can kind of think and do uh, find the bibliography at the same time. Yeah. Are there, have you read Joyce? I mean, have you read Ulysses or at least maybe probably more looked at it in Russian? And is it a satisfying translation? Is there potentially someone or a group who's trying to maybe retranslate it and bring it anew? I think of like in the inverse, we have um, the pair of, well, was it Belhovsky and Pivier who mm -hmm. have kind of redone so many of the classics into this kind of more modern read of, I don't want to say readable as in like constant garments is unreadable, but just maybe more natural for the present day. Is there, does Ulysses hold up like that in Russian or is there a desire for like a new Ulysses, a new Russian Ulysses? Yeah, so I, I haven't read the whole thing in Russian, but, but you know, parts, bits. Um, my, my impressions are, are, are positive and that, you know, everyone I've spoken to about it speaks very highly of it. it you know, it's a, it's a monumental task to translate uh, Ulysses. Um, uh, and um, uh, what was I going to say? Yeah, it, well, the, the initial translator is started by a translator uh, who called it the work on it. He compared it to penal servitude, so it was awful, an awful experience for, for, for him. Uh, he translated, um, I believe, about half or a third to half, it's not necessarily clear, and then he bequeathed the, this translation task um, to Haruji, uh, who did complete it in the late 80s, and then, as I said, it was, it was published in book form a few years later. Um, uh, he recently died, I think, uh, last year. Um, it, it's still, you know, it's the only completed Joyce translation, um, or excuse me, Ulysses translation, and everyone I've spoken to, anyone who reads Joyce in, in Russian um, appreciates it. I think it does get across uh, the different kinds of styles and different play, and, you know, you have to make um, compromises as you do in any translation, but it, but it definitely holds up. Um, I, th I think what's most exciting is that at the end of 2021, really right at the end of December, um, someone completed a, a full version of Finnegan's Wake, um, and he had been working on this for, um, I think, almost a decade, I, I think since 2014 or 13, I believe, self-publishing it online on, on his website and, and on Facebook, or um, and then it's publishable, it like, it's like published on demand, um, you can get it. Um, I think that's really exciting and that, you know, that was sort of the, the final frontier, all the, the short yeah. stories and the poetry, everything have been translated, but not a full, uh, Finnegan's Wake. And there, you know, there's many more challenges in this mess that Finnegan's Wake is. Um, I think that one, based on what I've looked at is, is perhaps a little less, um, successful or, I don't know, but more compromises have to be made there. Um, and I'd be interested in looking into it more. Um, you mentioned to uh, Pivier Balahonsky. Balahonsky, uh, her brother, uh, Andri Balahonsky, was a poet, um, kind of experimental avant-garde poet, and he actually translated bits of Finnegan's Wake in um, the 90s. So there's a, yet another connection between these worlds. No, that's very interesting. Um, I, I mean, I would be curious to check out part of the Joyce, or part of the Ulysses in Russian, because some of those natural word plays as a native speaker of English that we weirdly understand, even though, and I'm mostly talking of just the examples you shared in your book that I kind mm -hmm. of picked up on, I'd be curious how one translates them in Russian, you know, like how a Russian would hear turkey lurkey. It, you know, you can't translate that, but right. that kind yeah. of feeling that we understand, um, totally unrelated, or at least a future endeavor that'll probably be in a year or two once I finish the book. Um, one more comment, I guess, from the Joyce and Bielli um, uh, comparison is the role mm -hmm. of the visual in their writing, if you could comment on that. Sure. Yeah, I think the major difference here, um, <clears throat> excuse me, is, uh, to my mind, uh, well, I don't know, <laughs> for, for, for Joyce, um, the visual is significant, but I think so much of his art is uh, 
auditory oral. Um, he, it probably relates to his vision problems. He went blind or nearly blind um, on, on his way when he was writing these works. Um, and um, so much of it is about the musicality of language, which I think we get in, in Bieli with the, the playfulness of the, um, the meter and, um, and sort of inscribing that into this prose, um, the poetic prose. Um, and for Joyce, right, so it's, it's all about reading these books aloud and, and sort of appreciating the way uh, Irish English uh, would be spoken. Um, and using, you know, for instance, musical techniques in uh, the Sirens chapter of, uh, of Ulysses blending, taking elements of, of musicality into, into the, uh, uh, the literary and, and the written. Um, of, of course, at the same time, um, I think both for Bieli and Joyce, these, the, the visual significance. Um, and I think that also speaks to why Eisenstein in the Soviet Union was so fascinated with Joyce and actually wanted to film an adaptation of, of Ulysses. Um, and he visited, uh, he had a meeting like, like Nabokov had uh, with Joyce in Paris um, <clears throat> and uh, talked to him about, about his art. And it, as far as I recall, it was also uh, not, as <laughs> not as exciting or transformative as, as he would have liked a little bit more uh, banal as, uh, as, as Matthew mentioned, uh, with the, at least the first meeting that the book have had with Joyce. Um, nonetheless, I think, you know, images are, are also really key to both authors, um, visual images, and I don't know, I, I'm, um, things like the dog, the snot green sea, the visual, uh, the colors, and um, those sorts of things, and likewise in Bieli, this fascination with color and sort of things that pop out at you, these images. Um, yeah, I, I, I should also mention, I, I just remembered with the, the conversation about uh, Nabokov and, and Joyce, I, I think one, one key thing to take away from the reports of those and what Joyce himself said, um, uh, um, Sorry, <laughs> reading the comment too. Um, yeah, so the bulk of would kind of use those conversations that he had with Joyce or accounts of, of those times in Paris meeting him uh, to back up and justify his readings of Joyce's art. So the bulk of famously in his lectures sort of bats away and uh, critiques Joyce's stream of consciousness and then in Finnegan's Wake, the folkloric. Um, Turkey lurpy, as he, as he said, Zach, that, that, that sort of approach to language in, in literature. Um, and uh, Nabokov, unlike these other writers that I'm looking at, would use those meetings with Joyce to, um, to back up again and to, to, to claim some sort of authority that others couldn't in his interpretations of Joyce's works. And then the next step is that he would you know, say that in uh, Ulysses, there's a character uh, in a brown Macintosh, this figure that just appears in different places wearing a brown Macintosh. Um, it's never explained why he's in these places or who he is in the book of in the lecture says, I know who it is, it's, it's Joyce himself. Um, so a lot of <laughs> the way he reads Joyce is uh, commentary on himself and his own art and the sorts of techniques and devices and tricks that he placed into his own work. Um, yeah, so it goes back and forth. You can use it to, to justify and to explain his, his readings. No, that's, yeah. It, I, I'm curious um, because you have this and we have this you know, monumental text, whether it's something people read a lot or just refer to because it's kind of now been absorbed. Ben Rifkin taught his huge course on Anna Karenina. I know people have taught like a history, Slavic combined, you know, literary combined war and peace when um, I think a couple of universities were doing that. Um, and we just recently had the seminar on uh, Petersburg here at Berkeley. Mm -hmm. Do you foresee teaching something huge like that, like a Joyce and Co. big reading, a larger, I mean, is that, because you've done the Chernobyl course where you had the wonderful website, you've done other things that are kind of these bigger projects. And I'm wondering if you have 
maybe something in your, up your sleeve, you know, for the future. <laughs> students can be excited about or maybe, you know, worried about coming down the pipeline. <laughs> right. Um, I, I would love to teach Joyce this semester, another kind of full, full circle uh, moment. I'm teaching or completing an independent study with a couple students on, on Ulysses. So we're reading that together, um, like I did in college. Um, so that's been really nice and rewarding and, and revisiting and, I don't know, seeing, catching even more and given new context and, and new experiences and everything. Um, so I, I would very much like to teach a course on, uh, on Ulysses, on, on, on Joyce in some form, uh, you know, official regular course, um, not just an independent study. And, and I do think teaching the book of in uh, Joyce together would be a lot of fun. I know, um, uh, Gali Dement at uh, Washington, uh, yeah, Washington has has done that before. Um, I think that you know, well, uh, I, I think they're they're a great pairing. Reading uh, the, the Gift and, and Ulysses together as these city novels and uh, art novels of the artist and uh, artistic statements on themselves and kind of working through aesthetics um, and, and meta novels. Um, that would be a lot of fun. It's always just a matter of fitting it into a semester, so many pages yeah. and, and doing them justice. Well, and it seems like Ulysses, it's a page for an hour. You know, you, you get a page and you almost- Can be, yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> I'm wondering, you, so you just mentioned the cities and, you know, being a mm -hmm. huge fan of the Petersburg text, I, uh, Judith Kornblatt got me addicted to that. And I remember even picking up Olga's book in undergrad. I mean, just kind of that small world then I heard you introduce Stein, Stein being from Oakland, um, which is just relevant to me, Ulysses being from Dublin, or I mean, Joyce being from Dublin, let's just put Bielli in Petersburg. And I can say Oakland is almost this weird anomaly city in this bigger Bay Area uh, reference. Is there something about that location and being three different locations, but is there something absurd or hidden or is it because like times were changing. I, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on like the location as also potentially being just the connection of how like Bielli and Joyce could never have interacted and yet weirdly kind of fallen upon some of the same ideas or topics or tricks and literary techniques of that value. Yeah, I, I mean, I think you're, you're asking me to define modernism. <laughs> That's a giant question here. Um, but, but to address the, you know the, the the way you formulated it, yeah I think so you know it, it is of, of course a you know um, uh, a symptom a product of the times it's working through of um, the acceleration of life in the city in this moment with um, you know the results of industrialization the war I think looms um, uh, over all these novels, different wars, but <laughs> wars nonetheless, and revolutionary ideas in, in Ireland, um, uh, the uprising um, the questions too of nationality and nationalism and um, these, these issues of identity um, and how that becomes tied into um, uh, or linked up to cities and what, what cities can provide people. And they're both atomizing you know, all of these novels have to do with the way uh, these heroes are feeling very much out of place and displaced and exiled and um, uncertain about what they're doing in these vast cities, um, which are, again, representative of, of the wider world. It's not just one place. Um, at the same time, Ulysses certainly um, I don't know, some of the, the, the Russian novels are a little more pessimistic, like, like Envy, um, um, in terms of the city and, and more in general. Um, but Ulysses certainly is, is also about the unity and the community built up in these cities and the way uh, we intersect with others and can find or should find love and um, um, uh, community, um, Compassion Brothers, I think that's at the heart of Ulysses and, and certainly Leopold Bloom, our uh, <laughs> uh, quasi uh, Chernyshevsky figure there. Um, uh, and yeah, I, I think all of those things drew these writers to, to address their themes and situate them in these ways in relation to the city and um, kind of 
speed and displacement that they all experience there as well. That's, um, oh, good. We have one more comment and then I have a wonderful way to kind of wrap this up when we do. Um, mm -hmm. I would like to add that seeing in the case of Gelli is very important. Modernism, in fact, was very much influenced by avant-garde, especially art, especially painting. Um, mm -hmm. And going back to the visual, um, is there a painting that maybe lines up? So uh, two weeks ago or three weeks ago when Colleen spoke, she shared a picture, the classic Anna Karenina, like it's not her portrait, but it's the one like pasted yeah. on the front of one of the major translations. Is there a Ulysses picture, something? I mean, is there something that when you see it, you're like, oh, that's Ulysses, that's Joyce. Um, uh -huh. Essential visual. And there might not be. <laughs> For me personally or in the scholarship? <laughs> For you personally with scholarship influence? <laughs> <laughs> or, um, I mean, they're, they're, with Joyce, there's, it's everything, right? After Joyce, there was nothing and there was everything, as I said. As I said. Um, and I think, um, well, I know, you know, one connection that's been made is kind of collage and cut up pieces and Picasso and, um, <clears throat> that we there are ways to read parts of Ulysses in, in this fa fashion. Um, as I, I mentioned, wandering rocks and um, where you get these vignettes of different parts of the city and how people intersect and combine. Um, there, yeah, I think um, you know, there's studies along those lines that try to connect Joyce, that do <laughs> connect Joyce to the movements that he was uh, encountering in Paris, in Zurich, et cetera, uh, the Dada, uh, Dadaists in, in Zurich. Um, I don't know if there's, you know, a single image that's so closely linked to, to Joyce or Ulysses. Um, I, honestly, I, I think it's more Joyce himself, right? Uh, you see it on my cover, this sort of um, different variations on Joyce's face mm -hmm. um, and the little mustache, the eyes, et cetera. Uh, he himself has become an avatar for, for his work and for, for modernism and his brand of modernism anyway. No, that's, um, that's great. Uh, so I think we're out of questions and I would like to wrap up just so that people can move on with their days and those who haven't joined us can um, watch the videos soon on YouTube. Uh, unfortunately, you're not here and hopefully one of these days we can get you to campus, but I just wanted to kind of close with the fact that so Gertrude Stein is from Oakland and she has that quote, there's no there there. And there's a mm -hmm. funny little instance where if you're going up Stanford, which kind of splits Berkeley from Oakland, and then there's Ashby, which turns into MLK, which goes into Oakland, there is a sign at that moment where both cities end and it's kind of considered a joke from the city of Berkeley to the city of Oakland. One side is here and one side is there. Um, and it supposedly is a sign related to her. So it's just kind of interesting that these absurd intersections even exist as something that you barely miss or you usually miss when you're just driving across that area. Yeah. I'll show you when you come, but it is one of those interesting little things, literary things that I think we overlook because literature, while very important, the idea of reading the paperback book just isn't there like it was 20, 30 years ago. I mean, it, we've now got our phones and all these other fun things um, taking our time. So, but mm -hmm. I appreciate it. I, I'm so glad that you got to present and really kind of just take this topic that not all of us are familiar with and really bring in some of the things that we do know better, our Soviet and Russian writers that we um, covet and are, I think, falling more in love with as like time goes and it's becoming more distance of that era. We're starting to realize that there's all these other people and um, things that we need to bring out. So it'll be interesting in the next couple of years, Russian literature, the state of it and yeah. other trends we'll be bringing out. Right, but, no, for sure. I'm excited to see. Yeah. Uh, so thank you again. Um, and thank I thank the audience yeah. for the wonderful questions. Um, once again, it's just always great to get the insight of uh, um, our colleagues who come and join us. So thank you again, Jose. Right. I hope um, you have a wonderful afternoon and that the rain lets up behind you. Yeah. Um, well, it's a rainy day. <laughs> thank you. Thanks so much for having me. And thanks to, to everyone who, who tuned in. I appreciate it. Nope. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.